Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this evening's presentation on simple practices for maximizing gains with vertical spreads. In this presentation, Leo Valencia, host of the Gamma Optimizer service at ElliottWaveTrader.net, will cover the most common mistakes that options traders make when trading spreads and discuss ways to eliminate them. I'll be providing a link where you can learn more about Leo and his Gamma Optimizer service, but since I believe many of you are already very familiar with Leo, and since we have a lot to cover, we'll jump right into tonight's presentation. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Leo Valencia. Leo, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Tom, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon about this discussion. And the whole point of the talk is um, just take a look at option spreads and take a look at the mistakes I see the new members of the Gamma Optimizing Room that, that they make when they try to do uh, the trades that I suggest. No. So for those of you that are not in the Gamma Optimizer Room, most of what we do, basically all of what we do are option spreads. So it's important to understand the mechanics of the spreads and it is important to uh, avoid the common pitfalls that I'm going to describe. So the first thing is, let's talk a little bit about stocks and and futures because that's you know that's that's the world most of the people that comes to options uh, start in you know, most people start trading stocks or futures and then they decide to move to options then so it stocks is very simple to trade you know you if there is only one security to trade there is only one apple stock or one tesla stock or maybe there are two you know when you have google uh, special chairs or or Berkshire and Halloway special choose, but it's only one or two tops, no? So it's very easy to trade. And the same with futures. Futures are simple, even though you may have uh, different uh, settlement dates, but you know, most of the time people just trade whatever is the active date, <laughs> settlement date, and, and it's only one uh, symbol traded. But with options, options are, are a different beast, you know? Options are incredible barrier. For instance, SPX options, there are 12,000, more than 12,000 SPX options to choose from. You could pick one of 12,000. And for Tesla, which is, you know, is, is one of the darling, I guess, of, of traders, there, is, there are more than 6,000 options in total, you know. So when you trade um, this kind of instruments, you are never going to see a human being on the other side. The odds of seeing a human being on the other side of your trade are almost zero, no? And, and this is the first misconception that you have to remove from your head. You have to uh, be aware that you are trading against computers, period. And the reason is that there, is, there are no, you know, that it's very unlikely that you're going to have a human waiting for an order in each of the 12,000 SPX options or a human waiting for any of the 6,000 options in Tesla, as opposed to stocks, I mean, stocks, there is a good likelihood that you will hit a human <laughs> because it's only one, you know, if you're, if you're trading at, at market, you might get a human on the other side or you might get a market maker. But in general, with options, you are almost 99.99% sure that you're hitting a market maker. You're hitting a computer that is going to execute the order for you. Otherwise, the options market will not work, you know, you will not get enough people to to, to trade with you. And this is a very important thing to consider when trading options. That the fact that you are not trading against humans, uh, you are trading against a market maker, uh, which is computerized. Therefore, uh, the second misconception that you have to, to remove from your head when trading options is, uh, don't worry about bid or asks, or even the spread between those two things. Bid and ask prices in options don't provide any useful information. Um, and, and the reason is that options have derivatives. What it means is uh, derivatives follow another thing. In this case, options follow stocks or options follow the index. And derivatives, more importantly, don't obey the laws of supply and demand. There is, you know, you can have an infinite amount of people trying to buy an option, it doesn't mean that the option will go up in price. And vice versa, you can have um, millions of people trying to sell an option, doesn't mean the option will come down in price because there is no such thing as supply and demand for options. And the reason is uh, derivatives in general and options in particular are unconstrained. There is no limit 
for all practical purposes, I can create options out of thin air, no? <laughs> it's not like chairs. Chairs are constrained. Options are not constrained. So the takeaway from this is that never do market trades with options. Never, ever in your life hit the bid or the ask of an option. Never send a market order with an option. Why? Because the market for an option doesn't represent a real market. There is no such thing as price discovery for options. I, I, I don't know if uh, this is something that is easy to understand. Uh, in the stocks and futures, there is price discovery. You know, we don't know what the price of a stock should be. We don't know about what the price of a future should be. So there is price discovery, and, and we let market participants to figure out the price. For derivatives, there is no such thing as price discovery. Derivatives are priced from the, the underlying, and, and the only thing you are going to discover is how much money market makers are going to take from you. So please, never hit the beat or the ask. And this is something that I see on new members of the Gamma Optimizer room. And this is one of the mistakes, the first mistake you are going to uh, remove from your head. And one way to work this is you have to think about yourself as a liquidity provider. And what is a liquidity provider? Well, a liquidity provider is a trader that always uses limit orders. So you are going to use a limit order, not a market order, and always gets between the bid and the ask. And, and when you do that, you're providing liquidity because the, you are adding one extra order to the book. You know? So how, what is the price that the limit order should be? Well, the price that you should use is called the mid price. Uh, it's a concept that is very simple is basically you take the bid at the ask divided by two is the distance between the bid and the ask why the mid price well is because option dealers or market makers don't tell you but that's the price that options use you know that's how options are actually priced options are priced always at mid and the only thing a market maker does is he starts moving away from mid for the ask and move it away from mid from the bid. And that's how he makes money, he was moving away from the mid price. So you have to first recover the mid price and then use limit orders as close as mid to possible. I'm going to say, of course, market makers are not in the business of uh, giving you free meals, no? So getting mid is tough. No, mid is the theoretical price of the option, is the perfect price of the option. but as close as, as mid as possible. That's what I'm trying to say. I mean, you don't be, don't hit the beat, don't hit the ask, and don't be really sticky to the mid. I mean, you could work your your way around the mid, just a few cents above or a few cents below, and you will entice uh, option dealers to, to, to do the trade for you. So this is kind of a useful advice for those of you new to the world of options. And even if you're in a hurry to sell the options, it, it, let's say that you really want to un unload the options that you have because you're losing money, you want to cut your losses, don't, please don't send a market order. Send a limit order at bid, for instance, if you want to sell. No, so just put a limit order at bid if that's what you are willing to sacrifice, but always put a limit order. The moment, you use a market order. Remember, you are not dealing with humans, you are dealing with computers. At the moment you send a market order uh, for an option, you will notice how the bid and the ask will get really, really wide instantaneously. The moment you hit click uh, on your mouse or enter in your keyboard, you will get seriously penalized for sending a market order. You, you will be screw up. Um, you know, I guarantee that you will get this club a lot on that trade. So now let's talk a little bit about option spreads. No, so so that was the case with single options. Um, so let's look at option spreads. The spreads are basically is a construction where we buy and sell options simultaneously that are of the same type and with the same expiration. No, the only thing that changes is the strike. And vertical spreads are are the workhorse of pretty much all option trading. In particular, in the gamma optimizer room, that's the only thing we do. We do. We might do a butterfly here and there. I mean, we do combinations of these things, but the vertical spread is the centerpiece of everything. It could be calls or puts, but I, I mean, the whole idea is to simultaneously buy and sell options. And as an example, I have a, a, a vertical call spread for tomorrow that is buying the 3,355 strike call and is selling the 3,360 call. 
And, and here is where the second mistake I see uh, when people are doing open spread. So just because uh, it is written like this, you know, just because a vertical spread is written as two um, individual trades, doesn't mean that it has to be executed like this. So please, when you execute a vertical spread, you have to make sure that the execution is simultaneous. I mean, it's not like, okay, let's, I'm going to buy the 2,355, and as soon as you're filled, you sell the 2,360. No, it has to be simultaneous. You can never, and that's why I highlight, please never enter or exit a vertical spread leg, leg by leg. Don't do it individually. In fact, every broker in the United States is trained and prepared to execute the trade for you. They, they know how to execute a vertical spread. So, I mean, it's part of the instructions. When you give your broker the instructions, you don't tell your broker, oh, buy me the 3,355 call and sell me the 3,360 call. No, you call him and tell him, I want the vertical call spread where you buy the 3,355 and you sell the 3,360, you see, you have to be specific in the order and then the broker will be able to execute this order as a single entity. And I repeat, every broker in the US knows how to do that because you know, they were trained, they have to pass the certification for this. If your broker doesn't know how to do it, fire him. You, you have the wrong broker. Just get a broker that knows how to do this. And in fact, every electronic broker like Clink or Swim or I don't know, Scott Trade, I, I don't even know who is left now <laughs> for retail brokers. I guess there's so much consolidation in the industry. I don't know what companies are left, but I mean, any online retail broker can execute vertical spreads for you. Just be very careful and construct the trade as a vertical. So. So that's that's kind of the, the one of the most frequent mistakes I also see uh, in the gamma optimizer room. People think that they have two separate trades, and but in fact it's just one single simultaneous trade. And this brings me to the concept of atomic structures. I, I love to use this. We first it sounds cool, you know, any any time we say the word atomic. But to me, that's how I look at the spreads. And pretty much that's how I look at every trade I do in the Gamma Optimizer room. Um, if you know, atom comes from the Greek atomos, which means indivisible. It's something that you cannot divide. And that's, to me, that's what a vertical spread should be. It's, it's like an atom. It's, it's something that you cannot divide. From the outside, it looks like a single entity. You know, even though we know that inside it contains individual legs, from the outside is a single thing is an atom and because of that i treat them like that i open and close the vertical spreads as a single entity i never break an spread never never in my life i have broken an spread because that's the fastest way to lose lots of money i mean the reason we entered an spread there was a reason for it no <laughs> like if we enter an spread for a particular reason why will we break it why will we just get rid of one leg and just you know be left with a single long option or a single short option. It is it, it is the wrong way to to see vertical spreads and is the wrong way to trade them. If you are trading vertical spreads, it's because you have a thesis, and if the thesis is not working, then close it. You know, don't break the don't convert the position into something that is not. So this is the tier advice that I'm giving you. Once you have a vertical spread on don't break it, you know, close it as a single entity as well. Okay, so another interesting fact, uh, we, I already mentioned that because options are derivatives and they don't obey the law or supply or demand, then the bid and ask spread is kind of uh, not that useful, but with vertical spreads, and in fact, with any complex position, the, the the bid and ask of an spread is completely useless. It is basically is crazy. If you look at the bid and ask for a, any particular vertical spread, you will notice like negative values, or you can notice uh, the spread is like a hundred bucks. I mean, uh, incredible distances between the bid and the ask. And what I'm telling you is, in general, for options and very in particular for vertical spreads, ignore 
the bid and this. Please ignore it. Don't use that as your starting point. We forget about it and instead focus on mid price. I know that mid price uses the bid and the ask, <laughs> but what I'm telling you is focus on it. And in fact, most retail software, um, think or swim, interactive brokers, any software, you can configure it. You, you can go up to your settings and configure the software to, sh to display mid prices. So my, uh, I don't even know if it's a tier four, I guess. My next advice to you uh, as a best practice is to go to your software, to your broker's retail software, and change the settings and make sure that you're always displaying mid prices for your options and forget about bid and ask. Completely forget about it. And I know that I'm going to get tons of questions about liquidity, about blah, 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 blah. Forget about it. Nothing like that applies to complex options. Liquidity um, is not what you think it is when it comes to complex options trades. And we'll see that a little bit ahead why it doesn't apply. And the bid and ask, as I'm telling you, is, is just an artificial construction for options, for derivatives, and for vertical spreads is basically complete, absolutely irrelevant. The only thing that is good for is to compute the mid price. And, and again, you know, if, if, they, if this was an advice for normal options, it applies even more for vertical spreads is that please always use limit orders and or please always have the limit order as close as possible to the mid price. I know that in soft software, it, it can be called mark price or mark value, but I mean, every software has it. You just check the documentation, look at, you know, the help files from your, particular product and configure it to display mid prices and you will be free from the tyranny of bid and ask information. Okay, now connecting with why um, we don't care about bid and ask for options and for complex options in particular is the fact that you are not trading the normal book. I mean, when you when you have options, yes, there is a book of options, and there are some people offer options there, buy and sell. It's very similar to the order book for uh, stocks and futures. But for option spreads, it's, it's, it is useless to have that book. So uh, the exchanges that trade options like CBOE or ICE or NICE, those are, those exchanges have special order books for the spreads. And so it's a separate order book. It's not the normal single option order book. And it, it, that book lists all the potential trades that people are doing with complex options. And by complex options, there's the most, I mean, the most common constructs like vertical spreads, butterflies, condors, iron condors, and, and some, some complex books will also have ratio spreads and they will have conversions and they will have, I don't know, synthetics there like, uh, risk reversals too, but in general, that's what a complex book is. Why the reason, why do we need a complex book? Well, we need a complex book because uh, there is no liquidity at all for vertical spreads. I mean, you will not expect liquidity for a vertical spread. Just consider this, just consider for instance, SPX options or Tesla options, anything that is in the thousands. So you, we have 12,000 options in SPX. Can you imagine the potential combinations for the spreads with those options? I mean, it just completely quickly runs into infinite, no? Like how many different ways can you mix and match all these options? So no human could expect liquidity in a, at all in a, in a complex option because there is like, if, if using a single option is very unlikely you will hit a human with a complex option is, impossible you will hit a human. The, the, the odds that someone has the same specific construction that you have are almost zero. So therefore that's what we need a separate book. We need a book where I can go there and check, okay, who who is buying what kind of vertical spreads, who is buying what kind of butterflies, who is selling this, who's selling that. And that book uh, can be browsed by certain brokers. Uh, it all depends on the broker that you have. Uh, some brokers will allow for free, other brokers will request more money, um, but every exchange allows people to browse the complex book. 
I mean, you can, and there is such thing as a complex book, and you can see, I mean, you can go and see all of the trades listed, you know, you can see all the crazy spreads that people are doing. And, and that's why they bid and ask from the normal options book is useless because it's never used. You know, the book that is actually used for the trade is the complex book that has nothing to do with the normal one. The only thing is, is that yes, there is an arbitrage between the complex book and the normal options book. And, and in fact, without that arbitrage, no one will make your market for your complex trade. You see, that's how uh, market makers of spreads in general make money. They are arbitraging your, your order in the complex books versus the normal one. And I think that's fine because that's the only way to, to, to entice liquidity to a trade that otherwise will have no liquidity whatsoever. You know? So, and that's what is very important to have a limit order, you know, because there is no market. There is no market. <laughs> you have a complex options book. And I assure you that your order will be the only market order for that particular spread. Unless, I mean, it's one of the positions that we have in the gamma optimizer room where we have hundreds of people doing the same trade. But in general, if it's a random trade, you will not expect anyone else to be on, on that trade and you will expect zero liquidity. So, so you have to have a limit order. And then the limit order in the complex book uh, entice a market maker that say that, that looks for mispricing and say, oh, me, I can execute this and make a few cents here. And that's how money is made. Okay. And because of the of the complex book exists, you will notice lots of oddities and that, that are always present and it, it, they surprise um, no, novice traders like like uh, like new traders into the world of options are surprised by a few oddities. When the, the first oddity is that when you trade a vertical spread or when you trade a, a, a spread in general, you are only concerned with the limit value that you have for the spread. No? So in this example, if I have a limit spread of $1.5, there are infinite combinations that will give you $1.5. You, you know, we could buy an option at 3.5 and sell the other one at two, or one at six, sell the other one at 4.5. You, you, you name it, no? There are lots of combinations that will always give you uh, uh, the spread. So, Sometimes that's what you will notice that sometimes when you execute your spread and you look at your order confirmation, your 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 field your statement for the field you know, of the of the trade, you'll notice that the individual prices are not even close to the prices that the options had a few seconds ago. I mean, the option could be priced at one buck a second ago, and in your field it was priced at seven. No, I, like like prices become crazy when when these trades are executed, and but. You know, we don't care, you know, as long as the limit that you have in your order is respected, who cares what the market maker did underneath? But you will notice that market maker, market makers will play weird games uh, on the individual legs and they will, someone else is being screwed because of you. That's basically it. And, I, and who is the other person is screwed? Uh, well, some, some, some person that, sent a market order for a single option that happened to coincide with one of your legs. That is the person that is being screwed. So that's why it's so dangerous to send market orders for single options, because if, if, so, if, if a market maker is looking at your, at your complex option and this other guy is offering market at the single one that is part of your leg, he could just give you whatever price on that one. And, and you, as the, as the person that is trading the vertical spread, you will be fine because you have a limit order, but the poor other guy that was trying to buy an option, uh, he got an option for five bucks while he was uh, only at one a few seconds ago. So that's one of the oddities is just keep in mind uh, when doing complex uh, option trades. So finally, what, another of the mistakes that I see, this is one that is so hard to remove. I, I don't know what to do. I mean, short of uh, I don't know, <laughs> restraining physically the traders. I call it an atomic violation. And the atomic violation happens when we start on a spread and suddenly the position moves against us. No? So we open this nice vertical spread and the stock or the market is doing the complete opposite that we were expecting that it will do. No, it just moved in the opposite direction. So we are losing money on the spread. Now, of course, we are losing money because our thesis is being wrong. So we are losing money. 
But you know what? Some people think they are smarter than the rest of the universe. They, they think that they are discovering something new that no one ever, ever thought about it. And I say, wait a minute, I can't, wait a moment. I can split this atom. I can break this vertical spread and collect the profit that one of the legs is showing. Because of course, you know, if, if an spread is two opposite legs, one of them is going to show a profit, no matter what. You know? if, if the market goes against you, then probably the short leg is going to show a profit. But if the market is uh, in your favor, the long leg is going to show a profit. But uh, what I mean is if you, you have a trade in both directions, which is a vertical spread, it is, is of course likely that one of them is going to show a profit on paper. No? And then the temptation of breaking the spread is so high because I don't know why. Why, why do you want to do that? You want to take the profit of the short leg, for instance, no? But it doesn't change the fact that the, leg, that the long leg is losing money. It doesn't go, it doesn't make the losses go away just because you took profit on one of the legs, no? And in fact, it's so funny because it violates the most common principle on in trading in general. And I, I know you have heard this expression before that says that you, you know, just cut the losses and let the runners, the winners run, no? It's like, yeah, the winners should be, you should let them run and the losers, you should cut them. But once you break a vertical spread, uh, you are doing the opposite. You are cutting the winner, which is the short, the, the, the short in case, and you are letting the losses run. You keep a position on your book that is losing money and that is going to lose even more money in nothing changing. So, um, this is just circles back to never break a vertical spread. You know, it's, it's kind of the golden rule. Never do it. There is no reason to do it. There is no reason, not even when you're making money. You know, because when you're making money, it's, it's a, it's, there is no reason to do it in any of the two sides. Never break it. Uh, you, you, it never works. It has never worked in the past. And if someone claims that this works, they are lying to your face. It doesn't work. No. So please resist the temptation of breaking the vertical spread. If you are wrong in your trade, you are wrong. Just take the loss like a like a everyone else and move on. No. We 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 I can live with losses. If you look at the table of positions of the gamma optimizer room, you'll notice that I lose some trades too. We cannot win all of them. The important thing is to minimize the losses. So please don't break. Uh, a vertical spread. Okay, so so far I have been discussing, uh, talking about vertical spreads without telling you anything about them. They're just giving you some advice on what to do. I'm assuming you know a lot about vertical spreads. No, that, that was kind of the assumption coming into this particular webinar. But um, I would like to touch on why I use vertical spreads. Right? Why personally, and why uh, in the Gamma Optimizer room. I structure most of the trades as vertical spreads. And there are many reasons. And in these, the easiest reason is they are always cheaper than single options. It is true, no? It's like a, no matter what they are, what you do, uh, a vertical spread will be cheaper than using the normal option. And as a note, I will say not only they are cheaper, they are substantially cheaper. I mean, by substantially, I mean orders of magnitude cheaper. And, I have an example. This is an example from today. And it says that I have a, a put for the SPX, a 3,100 put for Ferrari 28, one month out. And it's priced around 15 bucks. That's, that's an expensive put. It's really expensive. But the put spread that more or less works the same is only quoted at 60 cents. So you can tell, you can see the difference in price. It's a tremendous difference. It's not that they just are cheaper, they, they are substantially cheaper. And this price differences, difference uh, is, creates a, a unique opportunity with vertical spreads. No, it's not only that I am a cheap guy that doesn't like to spend money and I want cheap trades, no. It, the fact that the spread is cheaper opens the door to a very interesting things. Of course, um, we are sacrificing something. No, the reason the spread, is, this vertical spread, is cheaper is because um, we don't have unlimited gains. No, that, that's what we are sacrificing. With the put, if the if the market goes to zero, we make tons of money. 
But with the vertical spread, we only make five bucks, no matter if the market collapses to zero. But I will say, I don't care about that because realistically there is no, you know, the market will not go to zero. And there are, realistically, there, are, there is no such thing as, as unlimited uh, profit. And, and also I can live with the trade-off. I have no problem on living with the trade-off of vertical spreads. So one of the consequences of a vertical spread is that it, it has defined risk and defined gains. Right from the start of the trade, you know how much money you're going to lose, which is the cost of the spread. Now that's how much you're going to lose. But also, as opposed to normal options, you also know what is the max gain of the trade. And this cannot be uh, overstated. I mean, it, this is so crucial. With normal options, we really don't know how much we're going to make. We can make anything from like one cent to a millions of dollars, I guess. I mean, all depends on where the market ends. But with, with vertical spreads, we know what the maximum uh gain is and it's very interesting it, it, you know we can measure it from the beginning and because we, we can measure it from the beginning we can compute risk reward for a vertical spread and so it's easier to compute the risk reward so the risk reward is the maximum net gain divided by the maximum loss that way we can use vertical spreads to make sure that we are trading uh taking trades that the risk reward is bigger than one in other words we want to take trades that make more money than we lose. No, that's the whole point of, <laughs> of, of computing risk reward. And risk reward is so easy to, is very easy to compute with um, vertical spreads as opposed to just normal options. And because of the same property, edge is also easier to compute. I'm not going, to, I'm not going into discussion of edge right now, but um, it's easier to compute and that's one of the reasons I use vertical spreads because I like to have all of these parameters defined from the moment I enter the trade. It helps me with trade design, it helps me with position sizing, it helps me with everything. Uh, it's much better to have uh, control over all these things. But this is the fundamental truth and, and, and a warning, there is mathematics here, please stay with me. I promise it's going to be brief, the pain will be brief. Um, vertical spreads are very powerful because what they add is that a vertical spread is just basically um, buying an option and selling an option a, a different strike and, and this formula uh, is very simple it shows what the cost of a vertical spread the cost of a vertical spread is basically the subtraction between the two you know i buy one and sell another one but i imagine uh, that you know we can pick different widths for the vertical spread we can buy a strike and then we can sell a strike that is 10 points away or 20 points away but we can also do the opposite we can start getting as close as possible to the strike we are in you know it's like the limit we are taking the limit we can we can look at a vertical spread where uh what happens if i i made the strike so close together that they are basically zero there is no distance between the strike and what this means is that we I am converting a vertical spread into a binary option. And this is a whole different world. You know, a binary option is a world um, that is completely different to the normal world of options. And this is the reason that I like to do vertical spreads. Maybe I am not as forthcoming with my members, but the truth is um, that most of the strategies in the gamma optimizer room are designed to use binary options, all of them. You know, well, so the thing is, the problem with binary options is that they are basically illegal in the United States. No, so no, no, if you are a United States person, a citizen or a resident, uh, you cannot trade binary options. There, there are many reasons for that. No, I guess mostly related to fraud back in the day and, and also mostly related to anti competitive behavior by CME. But anyway, Beyond that, I don't want to regress that much. The fact is that there's almost no market for binary options and it's almost no. So, but we can replicate them and the way we replicate them is with vertical spreads. But there is, an, there is a one reason why I like binary options. And the, re, the reason that I like binary option for those of you that are mathematically inclined, if you look at that equation, you'll notice right away that that's the textbook definition of a derivative. No, that's, that's what it is. It's, is a derivative of the price. So 
a binary option or a vertical spread in general, you can think of a vertical spread as a derivative of a normal option. So is whatever the normal option does, we, de we take the first derivative with respect to price. And that is with the true power of vertical spreads. That's how the gamma optimizer room can have returns of 100%. For last year, for instance, last year, the, the room returned one, 101%. And so far in January, the room has returned 18%. And this is the reason. The reason is that we are taking advantage of this particular mathematical formula. And how? Well, this is how. <laughs> so uh, it is a, it's a little convoluted, but it's easy to follow. Uh, so just bear with me for a second here. So remember in normal options. You know, with normal options, you, re you remember the concept of delta. Delta is what connects the price of the underlying the stock or the index with the price of the option. So for every dollar the underlying changes, there is a change in price in the option that is called delta. Now, so, so delta is okay, I guess, but I, I don't like delta that much. To me, gamma is, is the most important thing. And so if, if instead of an option, I use a tight, a, a vertical spread that is very tight, that is almost zero the width. Of course it's not zero, but I mean a very tight vertical spread then it approaches a binary option. And because it is, it approaches a binary option, then it is priced as the first derivative of the normal option. So this means that when the stock moves, the vertical spread changes with the second derivative of the stock price. You know, So because we are taking derivatives twice, you now delta is the first derivative, and then for the binary is another derivative on that. What does it mean? I mean, in pure English, no, no, no calculus, normal English, well, it means that a binary option or a tight vertical spread, which is the same thing for a practical purposes, exposes you to gamma, to pure gamma, because it exposes you to the second derivative of the price of the underlying. In other words, if the underlying moves a little bit, the vertical spread is going to move gigantically. It moves a substantial amount. You are actually extracting gamma with a vertical spread. With normal options, to extract gamma, you have to go and do all sorts of interesting workarounds to extract just gamma. Now you have to buy the option, hedge, you, know, you have to do all sorts of weird stuff just to extract gamma. But with a vertical spread, we don't need to hedge. We are extracting gamma by definition. So the net effect is the vertical spread sees gains accumulate substantially faster than normal options. That's the net result. The net result is I do vertical spreads because I know for a fact, and because it's based on mathematics and the modeling of option prices, that a vertical spread will bring to me gains that are orders of magnitude higher than a normal option because we are exposed to pure gamma, by the way. And also, these are just a, a little extra things about about uh, vertical spreads. They, we, you know that that options offer time decay, and I know everyone hates time decay. But I know everyone hates to hold options because they lose time, they lose value over time. So, in the case of vertical spreads, they are less sensitive to time decay, as well as the sensitivity to implied volatility, and this is fantastic. Because you know, not not all of the time we can get cheap options, but most of the time we can get cheap vertical spreads. Because we, because we have two opposite legs simultaneously, then most of these effects cancel. You know, the time decay from the long leg gets cancelled with the time decay of the short leg because we are collecting money on one leg. It's not completely removed, but is is substantially reduced. And the same thing with implied volatility, you know, with the, the sensitivity of implied volatility of the long leg is, is minimized um, by the sensitivity to implied volatility of the short leg. And so the, the, the tighter we make the spread, the less sensitive it will be to those effects. So trading is actually easier with the spreads as well because they are less sensitive to decay and implied volatility. And finally, and I appreciate that you have stuck with me this long, <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, the true parameter, the parameter that really um, 
has a tremendous impact in vertical spreads is a skew. It's perhaps the most important effect on uh, the price of one spread. Uh, vertical spreads are ultra sensitive to skew. And this is a tremendous advantage because it can work in our, our favor. And that's how I use them in the optimizer room. One of the reasons we are so successful in the optimizer room is because I'm using a skew to my favor. And for instance, negative skew, which is ever present in index options, <laughs> ever present. Negative skew makes out of the money put the spreads cheaper than they should be. If a skew were flat or zero, uh put a spread should be priced you now based on implied volatility that you have a value but because we have negative skew they are cheaper we can enter the position for substantially less money than otherwise and this is a tremendous advantage of index options but incredibly advantage and it's a puzzle you know uh, academics and all sorts of in smart people have wondered why it is still present. What if you know? Because we know that put spreads are actually cheaper than they should be, and yet they continue to be so. Like 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 this is this is one of these uh, structural anomalies in the stock market, and it has never gone away. It has been like this since 1987, and I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't care. The only thing I want to do is exploit. The anomaly also has a. A corresponding effect for call spreads is positive skew makes call spreads cheaper than they should be. And you have positive skew in a few underlines. For instance, positive skew is present in volatility instruments like VXX. So call spreads in VXX are cheaper than they should be. Positive skew is also present in most commodities like oil and gold. And so you should you could take advantage of positive skew in in spreads for for commodities and not to be <laughs> outdone there is positive skew in index options as well but it is you have to find it you have to find the positive skew on the far out of the money call spreads and for those of you that have been in the gamma optimizer room you have noticed that that's pretty much what i do i do really out of the money call spreads like one or one and a half percent away and one of the reasons i pick them is because that's the area where the skew becomes positive and therefore i get these call spreads cheaper than they should be and the same with put spreads i get put spreads two percent down two and a half percent down and they are substantially cheaper so it's like taking candy from a baby i guess no like we are exploiting some <laughs> structural um uh, inefficiencies in the options market but and, and that's what we do so so this is kind of the discussion about vertical spreads i really hope uh you folks enjoy it and i i, I you know provided the, the rules of thumb at the beginning and just a little theoretical work at the end so please any questions i'm more than happy to answer them that's fantastic, Leo. Thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. So we'll jump right into the questions and, and please everyone um, feel welcome to use that questions box to submit any questions. So this is a little bit different than what you talked about, but I did want to see if you wanted to weigh in just any thoughts about this uh, situation. So we're talking about not legging into verticals, but uh, do you have any opinion about if someone happened to just take a, a directional, say, call or, or or put position, and then as it's moved in their favor, then turning it into a vertical at that time later? Yes, well, it is an interesting question, and and I always I always wonder why anyone will do that. I guess I guess one of the reasons, one way to, to see this is that you want to pocket some gains, some gains early. No, that's what it is. That's what you want to pocket some gains. Um, but there is no advantage to, to doing that, I guess. If you really think that the position is profitable and you like the thesis, what you should do instead is just take partial profits and let just a little bit of the position to run. But by by using a short leg, then you are collecting some profits, but then you are limiting the potential upside of the trade. So I really don't see that as a very efficient uh, thing to do. If the thesis remains valid, then just collect some profits and let a little, little bit run in. Fantastic. So if you were going to, I'm going to keep moving on because we are getting some questions coming in. So we do want to try to get to as many of these as we can. Um, 
in terms of uh, there was a someone asked expressing concern about if you're in one of these vertical spreads, do you run the risk of let's say it's a, a call spread getting called away on uh, a portion or one of the legs? Yes, vertical spreads uh, do carry uh, assignment risk if if they get in the money. No, and and that's a very good question. And and the, one of the reasons that I tend to only do index options is because index options index options are European options, and I love European options because they can never be called away. So <laughs> that's what I instead of doing SPY spreads, I do SPX spreads because they uh, they cannot be called away. They cannot break your spread. So this is a little bit longer one. Uh, it has multiple parts, so if we have to break it up again, let's. Uh, do you prefer credit or debit spreads, and do you always hold until expiration? Okay, so another good question. I didn't want to address in this presentation in general. I mean, this could be done for a for a different webinar uh, uh, about like methodologies with the spreads and all the theoreticals. But there is no difference between a credit spread and a debit spread. Period. Uh, and the reason is the no free lunch <laughs> hypothesis that I have. There, is, there are no free lunches in the market. No, the market there is no money lying around in the market. If a, a credit spread were better than a debit spread or vice versa, I could design a position that will make money for free. I could sell the one that is better and buy the one that is worse, and vice versa. No, I could, I could. Uh, a, you know, a structural trade that will just pocket the difference between the two. So, because of arbitrage uh, limitations, because of there are no free lunches, um, the one is not better than the other. One. That being said, uh, one is more liquid than the other one. So, in general, any spread that is out of the money is more liquid. So, so it could be if if the spread that is more liquid is credit, then I will recommend the credit. No. Or if the spread that is more liquid is is debit, I will recommend the debit. That's the only, that's the only, the only thing you know. Uh, liquidity and liquidity is more prevalent for out of the money strikes than in the money strikes. And the second question is, if I hold to expiration, no, no, I don't, I don't tend to hold to expiration because the whole point of, if, if you look at the mathematics, the whole point is to maximize those gamma gains, and and those gamma gains. Uh, present themselves really early in the trade and it has been my experience that it, they present really early in the trade so i tend to pocket gains uh, really early i think you know if i get really good gains in the next in the next three or four sessions i pocket them i might leave one contract <laughs> uh, to expiration just in case to get like the jackpot but that's what i call a jackpot that is more for fun than for anything else so that's a great part because there was uh, two follow-up questions on this, and one was, "Is there a percent gain or loss where you, uh, where you just get out of the position?" And really, more you're you're tracking. Uh, well, let's for gains, you're tracking. Have you kind of reaped out all the gamma, uh, or have you done it quickly, and then that you might choose to to go to the sidelines at that point if you've seen a bulk of what you were expecting from it. Correct. So, so basically, it's very simple. And because vertical spreads are so cheap, that's it. That's my stop. My stop is the vertical spread. It is the cost of the spread. So, if I'm spending sixty cents on the spread, that's it. Yeah, I, because I'm willing to lose those sixty cents, and I use that um, value uh, as the parameter to size my trade. Now, if if I'm willing to lose sixty cents, then that means I can do hundred contracts now, uh, or fifty, depending on your risk tolerance. So. So that's kind of the stop loss. I, I don't. I, I try not to close the spreads early on unless they are kind of expensive. If they are cheap, forget about it. I, the, my stop is the spread. Now, in terms of profits, yes, I mean, we tend to forget that, that we are making lots of money. For instance, I closed an spread uh, yesterday that was up 70%. And I, I know some, some members would like the spread to be higher. <laughs> Man, seventy percent in two days. I mean, where else can you get those kind of returns? No, you have to really sit around and smell the roses, as they say. So, so substantial gains deserve to be pocketed. I mean, even though the maximum gain could be a thousand percent, I don't know. But realistically, come on, you know, anything that approaches hundred uh, percent, it, it is worth of 
of pocketing, you know, cashing out. Absolutely, those are good gains. And then the last, the last kind of part of this was, um, do you have any opinions or thoughts uh, that you'd want to share about iron condors? Oh, okay. This is the this is the tricky question. Well, uh, the first thing I would say about iron condors in general is I I hate them. No, but it's it's more like a it's, it's, it's like a running joke, but it has some some truths underneath. Um, I hate them because they are being marketed to to beginner traders as the perfect trade destruction. No, if you if you buy any book about how to become a millionaire with options, no, <laughs> the, the core of the book is doing iron condors. It, it seems to be a favorite topic of con artists and people that really are not interested in the traders. They they, they think they discover something that doesn't exist. And an iron condor is a way to extract um, gamma from the market. No, it's a short gamma trade in general. And I don't like it. It has negative edge, and I don't do them. I, I only do iron condors. Um, I, more exactly, I do things that resemble an iron condor. You know, they look like an iron condor, but they are not really iron condors. They tend to be binary strangles, and I like binary strangles. So, so if it's a binary strangle where I'm benefiting from from gamma, I'll do it. But as an iron condor, as something that's trying to extract some premium out of the market, it is very dangerous. Very good. So the uh, complex options books. Is there a hyperlink where uh, where people can access that? Well, it depends on your broker. I know for the CBOE might might have like a public page where you can see them, but you will have to. I haven't been to into their website in a long time. CBOE is the Chicago Board of Exchange. is is kind of the biggest options uh, exchange in the U.S. So if you if you play with their website, you go there. You might find the you can browse the complex options, but I don't have a link handy. I know that Thinkorswim might also show you complex uh, uh, spreads, but I don't know how I don't I don't use Thinkorswim that much. <laughs> so it's something it's, it's more like a homework. Do, uh, it exists, and some brokers are allowed to see it. You touched upon this uh, when talking about when when you're selecting the spreads and and kind of the uh, what you spend being. In, uh, your stop, so to speak. But the question was, are there any steps a trader can take to mitigate the loss if a spread trade starts to go against them? Yeah, so yeah, so the questions are always useful. Uh, this connects with a different subject that is position sizing. You know? if, if if losing money hurts, hurts you, then that means that you are in the wrong size in the trade. You know? So for instance, if I open a single contract that costs $60, I don't care if I lose sixty dollars. I mean, I don't lose sleep you know, on every night for sixty dollars. But if I have six hundred thousand on the line, then that's a different, you know, it's the same. It's the same contract. It's just one thousand contracts, no? It is, so sizing is what makes the difference. And instead of thinking about a stop loss with options, think about size. It is my my best recommendation. Also, vertical spread, in particular, if it's cheap, it can go to zero really quickly. No, uh, because it's, it's, it's almost zero, you know, 60 cents. It's really close to zero already. So um, vertical spreads, the best way to handle them, to think about them, in particular if they are cheap, is to assume that all capital will be lost in the trade. No, assume that. And then with that assumption, size it uh, to, to a level where the total loss is comfortable. Like it won't cause pain to your account and to you. Are strangle spreads configured um, in the Gamma Optimizer service uh, to make the skew either positive or negative less sensitive? So are they configured to make the, the skew less sensitive? No, no. So, so yeah, so, so it's the opposite. In the, <laughs> what I want is sensitivity to skew. What I want is a skew is one of these gifts that, that, that the market, modern markets have. You know? Before 1987, there was no skew. In the market, so so options market options had no skew whatsoever. The skew only start appearing after the crash of 1987, and because it appeared, it's a structural deficiency of the market, 
it has never gone away and what we want is actually to exploit it so so i want and in the gamma optimized group what we want is to exploit the skew in our favor so i really want positions that are very sensitive to skew that's what i want i want something that is very sensitive because that's how i played them i i entered a position thinking that the skew will be higher later on so i want it to be really sensitive to skew so it makes more money because of it and so so vertical spreads are very sensitive to skew and and instead of minimizing take advantage of it the skew is our friend there is some questions also around skew again so i thought maybe if if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to just def, kind of define and introduce skew again um, and, and okay so, yeah so so what is a skew let me see if i can uh, well i don't have a graph here handy but just think about a skew as the following um the price of an option depends of a parameter called implied volatility no implied volatility is is the most fundamental parameter for the price of an option no and but before 1987 you know before the crash of 1987 implied volatility was synonymous with future volatility no so before 1987 someone will say oh i think the market is is going to have this volatility in the next 30 days so there's only a single value because you know you think that the volatility is going to be this value and with that single value you will compute the prices for every option no? and that's how it used to be so what it means is before 1987 implied volatility for all of the options of a particular stock or for an index was exactly the same or every option had the same implied volatility now after the crash when people realize after all those losses they realize man that's wrong and, and options have different prices in particular puts are more expensive than calls why because even though crashes are really uh, are scarce uh when they happen the move is is substantially faster so so a market in other words the market is more likely to fall 1000 points than to go up 1000 points that's that's kind of it. during the crash the speed of the crash is really fast versus during upside which is a slow what that means is option builders started to overprice puts the so puts became overpriced because they didn't want to lose money again so when when puts are overpriced if you run the same form mathematical formulas for price, you discover that implied volatility for all of the options is different. It's like it's a complete different implied volatility. And a skew is basically the difference between implied volatility. So for instance, I could say, okay, let's look at the 10% down put. You know, I go 10% down put and I compute implied volatility. Then I go to the 10% up call and I compute implied volatility. The difference between those two is a skew. And in index options, so if they were the same, skew will be zero. But in index options, implied volatility for puts it's higher than implied volatility for calls. Therefore, is negative. You know, the skew is negative because it's defined as the implied volatility of the call minus the implied volatility of the put. And and it has been ever present. And that's what its skew is. Is a uh, you know, perhaps I should do a webinar about this at some point, but it is, a, it is a very fascinating subject and it has a tremendous effect on vertical spreads and butterflies. And it favor us. You know, the, the, the key takeaway is that a skew works in our favor because it is a structural deficiency of the market. We are getting a lot of feedback that people would love more, so maybe we'll have to turn this into a series and I think it'd be very... Uh, uh, very well received. So I do want to try to get to at least a few more questions here. Uh, someone's saying that they normally, for uh, for their options tradings, they're normally looking 30 to 40 days out. What's your sweet spot for your vertical spreads? Okay, so as you notice, it's seven days out. And, and there are the reasons for that. And for those of you that know me and they have been in the Gamma Optimizer services, you know that I love near-term options. And one of the reasons that I I love near-term options is because gamma is substantially higher uh, for near-term options. So it is it is one of these another structural anomaly. Gamma becomes more and more prevalent the closer you are to expiration. So I I mean I would love to go one day to expiration, but I, I do seven days as a as a way. So yes, ultra short-term trades because I really want to to extract gamma. So I go 
very short duration and I use vertical express just to maximize gamma. So the gamma optimizer room is indeed a gamma <laughs> optimizing uh, room where we, all of the trades are designed to extract as much gamma as we can from the market. And how are those strikes selected, both call and put? Is it is it just that set going one to one and a half percent and two to two and a half percent, or is there some variation and and how do you make those decisions? Well, that's a secret sauce, no. But in general, um, the, we have systems, we have quantitative systems. For instance, we have what it used to be called the NLA, or the neural nets. So, so we have a specialized neural nets that helps you help us pick strikes going forward. And also my experience with the market, you know, I have volatility models and I, I can see about volatility expectations um, in the near term. And I look for, for, for mispricings you know, of those volatility expectations. So that, that, that provides the strikes. You know? it's, 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 not, it's, it's something that it takes a little while to figure out. I, you have to run this through some mathematical models to come up with um, with, with the good strikes, but yeah, you know, we have the tools and I have the experience and so combining those two, we, we can create the strikes for, for the optimal trade. Right, and those are uh, some of those tools or at least maybe some of the outputs um, members also have access to as well as, as you said, there's also a lot more uh, computation that's going on behind the scenes during the day and then you're providing uh, members of the Gamma Optimizer service with that output. Okay, this is this is what I found and, and then you kind of present it and display it as well as include any potential trades that you see um, around Correct. that is that perfect. So I think this spills into probably a great final discussion because a lot of there are a lot of questions also then starting to trickle into um, about your gamma optimizer service. And for everyone here, I'm going to uh, provide in the chat box a another link. So just if you're not familiar with uh, Leo or you're maybe not familiar with his service. I just put in a link to go to about page where you can learn a little bit more about Leo and about the Gamma Optimizer service. And you can also uh, get started right there. If you've been a member of Elliott Wave Trader before, you can log in under your account and, um, and get started with the Gamma Optimizer service. Of course, anyone that's never tried ElliottWaveTrader.net uh, before, you can get a 15-day free trial to many of our different services, including uh, Leo's Gamma Optimizer service. So you can Taste it, try it out, and see if it's something that would work for you. But maybe Leo, uh, Leo, we could close up by just talking a little bit about what people will see inside of the Gamma Optimizer service, and also maybe you want to start here. You did mention a little bit about last year's performance, uh, so maybe you could just highlight some of the high points of um, what type of trades they're going to see and what the performance has recently been um, inside of the service. Yes, uh, so the, I like to think that the Gamma Optimizer Room is a space for people to learn more about the options because the options are a complex world, you know, they, they are difficult products. So I, I want to create first an educational experience. So the Gamma Optimizer Service to me is first education, but we also trade, you know, because that's, you know, that's the fun of it. You know? The reason we pay for the service is to make money. So I, I provide official trades and the performance of the official trades has been excellent. Uh, last year, the official performance for 2018 was 101 point something percent. You know? So people double their accounts easily following the official trades. And um, so far this year, it has been around 18 percent just for January. So tremendous results. And and all of the trades that I do are explained and they are based on, on, the, on the tools that I provide plus my own insights now. And I also, in the room, we also do uh, trades that are requested by members. Members might have ideas and, and they talk to me and I, and I look for ways to express those ideas with options and well, what is the best trade structure for this particular idea that the person has. So, so it's a combination, it's a community where we help each other. That's that's a great summation, and and I'm glad you brought up the fact about uh, that free flowing discussion that happens in the room, including about things that maybe you're not closely tracking, because um, as you said, a lot of your trades will be on the S and P and on the index options. But there is discussion about individual stocks, and I know that's something that was coming up in a couple questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, but that's something where if someone sees an opportunity or or thinks they have a um, a bias on a certain stock for for any given reason. Uh, the room can kind of talk about and look at ways that you might be able to play a certain scenario in a stock, the best way to either optimize gamma or um, something along those lines. Is that right? That's correct, Tom. And I think that that's, most of the trades that, I, that you will see are actually requested. I, I am a very 
um, cautious trader. I, I, I never over trade. I do one or two trades per week. But most of the trades, it just requests people, uh, you know, love to trade gold or love to trade miners or they want to trade interest rates. So, so they, they just tell me what they, what they think is happening. And I say, okay, if you think that will happen, I think this is the best way to do it, you know. That's fantastic. So I'm sorry for everyone that we couldn't get to every single question uh, this evening, but uh, we hope that's uh, an opportunity for you to, to come on into ElliottWaveTrader.net and Leo's Gamma Optimizer service and give it a try. And uh, you'll be able to uh, review the, uh, the past performance of the alerts. You'll be able to follow along with everything in real time. And uh, you'll also be able to ask questions to Leo and, and start engaging in the room in the community and see if it's something that can work for you. So Leo, just on behalf of everyone, uh, attending tonight and, and based on the, the feedback of people wanting more of these, um, uh, I just want to thank you for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. It, it was uh, uh, really eye-opening. Thank you, Tom, and thank you everyone for joining. I really appreciate all you coming here tonight.